Um, uh, it's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk with you a little bit about anxiety and some strategies for managing it. So if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen so that we can take a look um, at some slides. So give me a moment here. <clears throat> So hopefully you are looking at a um, title slide. Can someone just confirm that you can see it okay? Yes, you're good. All right, great. We're off to a good start. Um, so the, the, the topic for today is changing thoughts and actions to manage anxiety, how to use cognitive and behavioral strategies. And I'm going to work through, I know that's a bit of a mouthful. I'm going to work through um, what, what that means as we, as we go along here. Um, I do want to disclose I'm a research consultant for a company called Onco Health. That doesn't impact anything we're going to talk about today. And I wanted to just get us started um, with some um, points that I think just lay a nice groundwork for a conversation like I hope to have with all of you today. So I'm sure it goes without saying, but it's always nice to remind everyone um, the importance of of respecting each other's privacy and that the things we talk about here, particularly if people share personal experiences, stays here. Uh, I do want to recognize that talking about emotions can be difficult um, and that it can be uh, really helpful and important to use words that work for you. So I'm going to use words like anxiety, but if that doesn't fit your experience and there's something else that works better like worry, feel free to use whatever, whatever words fit you. I am going to stop throughout um, these slides to uh, hopefully have some conversation with all of you about some of the topics that we're talking about, rather than have me just speak at you um, for a long period of time. Of course, um, there's no expectation or pressure to, to share. If you have something you'd like to share with the group, um, please feel free to, to do so. But of course, you don't you don't have to. Um, during those times where we might um, be uh, talking with each other, I might have to interrupt that conversation just so we can get through the rest of the content and make sure um, everybody gets to hear what they what they want to hear. And of course, those interruptions aren't personal. It's just so that we can manage our time well. Um, I, I also know just based on conversations with Aaron before today that we might have people who have gone through cancer themselves um, with us. And we might also have people who were caregivers or support persons for the person with cancer. Um, and, and that's great. It's always wonderful to have people with different experiences. I do just want to recognize that sometimes the person with cancer and their, their caregiver or support people need separate spaces to talk about um, their emotions and their experience of cancer. Of course, we're not going to do that here today, but just want to recognize that sometimes that's more comfortable for people. So those are those are our starting points. Um, our plan is to talk a little bit about anxiety, you know, what it is, what triggers anxiety, what brings it on. And then we'll talk a little bit about this um, cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety, um, which is a, a well-founded set of strategies for managing anxiety. You may or may not have heard of it. That's okay. Um, we'll walk through it. And, and based on um, what we learned about cognitive behavioral therapy, we'll talk about some concrete strategies for managing anxiety um, that, that you might be you might already be using, or maybe you can build into your day to help manage anxiety a bit better. So what what is anxiety? Let's let's talk about this um, for a moment. So uh, the maybe the most important point is that anxiety is a really normal reaction. So when any of us feel like we're in danger or we're we're being threatened by something, anxiety is our normal. Re it's what our brain and body do to protect ourselves. So you might have heard of the fight, flight, or freeze response. The reason we have this response is because it protects us when our, our brain detects that we are in danger. So it's very normal. It's very good. Um, 
given that, it's not a weakness. And the reason I say that is sometimes people feel that if they're feeling nervous or worried, that that means they're not handling things well or something is wrong with them. And that's not the case at all, um, particularly when we're talking about something as stressful and, and um, intense as cancer, that's a real threat. So of course, anxiety is going to be a normal reaction to that threat. So in no way is that a weakness. That being said, anxiety is really uncomfortable, right? We don't like to feel that way. And it can make getting through our daily life really difficult. Um, or we might be distracted by worrying thoughts. We might have a hard time sleeping. Um, we might be more irritable, which interferes with our relationships. So even though it's a normal reaction, sometimes it's not helpful. And that's why we talk about ways to manage that anxiety so that it's not, so that it's not interfering so much in our lives. There are, as you can see here, there are a lot of symptoms of anxiety. And when I say symptoms, I mean the um, emotions and the, the physical feelings that we have when we feel anxious. And I want to highlight that anxiety does have both emotional symptoms and physical symptoms. And you can see a list of some of those of some of those here. Um, so everything from feeling nervous and worrying, feeling irritable, to physical symptoms of um, having increased heart rate or breathing. People will have chest pain. You might have heard of someone going to the emergency room because they thought they were having a heart attack when really it was anxiety. That's how intense the physical symptoms can be. It's very scary. Um, so there are lots of ways that uh, we experience anxiety and you probably don't have all of these symptoms because everybody experiences a little bit differently, but I do just want to highlight that you might have both emotional and physical symptoms. So let's pause here for a moment, and I just want to open it up um, to the group if you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about your experience of anxiety. So you don't have to answer all of these questions, but these are just some thought questions. How do you know when you are anxious? What, what physical symptoms do you have? What emotions do you have? Is there something other people notice um, when you're feeling anxious that you might not notice yourself? Is there any? Anybody like to share about their experience of anxiety? I have trouble sleeping. Ah, uh, yeah, trouble sleeping. Sure, that's a really common. That's a really common symptom. Um, and if you don't mind me asking, do you have a sense of what's keeping you awake? Like, are you thinking? Are you, are you? Do you have, is your heart rate going? What is it that makes it hard to fall asleep? Thinking. Just thinking. Can you continue to think? Mm, yes. Yes. Those thoughts can really build on each other, right? You have one thought that leads to another, leads to another, and, and um, pretty soon your brain is off and running. Sure. Yes. And it's, and it's hard to shut it down. Mm -hmm. It has to be, but it's hard to shut down. It most certainly is. Yes. Thank you for sharing. Lori, I see your hand up. Yes. I'm sorry for being behind the curtain, but I'm, I'm not dressed for the occasion. <laughs> okay. It's okay, no um, worries. I, with technology, technology makes me insane. I'm having trouble lately with my computer, for example, and I get mm -hmm. really kind of berserk. I, I cry and I want to throw things and I want to smash the laptop and sure. I, I shake and no. I just take it, you know, it's just, you know. Okay, sure. So it sounds like one of your triggers for anxiety is technology or challenges with technology. That's something that will trigger your anxiety. Um, and then you feel a lot of frustration and irritability around that. And I'm, I'm sure we can all empathize in some way when our technology isn't working well. So yeah, great. Thank you. Was there someone else trying to trying to get in there? Hmm. Oops. Don, were you trying to say something? I don't want to. Um, no, I, I don't think there are, not really. I I had two invitations to two Zoom meetings at 12 o'clock. 
Okay. <laughs> so I've been waiting. I've been waiting for MSK to come on. And then, then I realized it wasn't MSK. It was Gil. So I apologize for my lateness. Oh, no worries. No worries. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Hey. No, it's, it's, um, uh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm curious what you had to say, and I'm sorry I missed your opening, but um, for me, uh, it, it's um, it's a long-term, anxiety is a long-term thing. In other words, uh, to be perfectly frank, I don't know what the ending is going to be like, my ending. Mm. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a lot of pain or if I'm going to, as they do in the movies, uh, fall asleep with the 20 members of your family sitting around and saying what a wonderful life he had. So... <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 uh, and it's something that I really, um, I think I'm, I'm going to control over. I will also tell you that to an, about a year and a half ago, I had cardiac arrest. So in fact, I, I was dead for about 20 seconds and, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of actually was very, uh, revelatory for me because mm -hmm. at least, and forgive me if I'm being too frank, but it made me understand what it might be like to die. Mm, and so sure. that actually removed a lot of anxiety from me because for me, at least death, one of the problems was it, it, it was unknown. Mm -hmm. Sure. And now sure. I, I feel I know it or I know part of it anyway. So okay. anyway, I, I don't know if that's any help to you, but so I, I wanted to be on this, um, hear, hear you talk because it's just an ongoing um, concern for me, you know, it's, it's always in the background having okay. cancer. It's always in the background. Yeah. So. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. And, and I think, um, the unknown, whether, um, regardless of what the focus is, right. The unknown can be very anxiety producing, um, when things seem undefined or ambiguous and, and cancer creates a lot of situations, um, that are unknown, whether it's what the side effects of a treatment are going to be, or maybe you're waiting for a test result, or, you know, what there's lots of situations in cancer where um, you're not quite sure how things are going to go. And, and oftentimes people will tell me that those periods are the hardest uh, because when you know something, even if it's a hard thing to know, you can do something. But in those moments where there's not anything that you can do and you're waiting or it's uncertain, those can be very anxiety producing. So um, I, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing your experience with that. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on numbers and stats and all of that, but I did want to share um, that anxiety is very common in people with cancer. This probably isn't surprising. So you can see some numbers here with up to half of people with cancer reporting what we call subclinical anxiety. All that means is that these are, these are folks whose levels of anxiety might not meet like a psychiatric diagnosis, but it's it's high enough that it's problematic for them, right? It's causing, it's making it hard to get through the day. It's, it's really uncomfortable. So these are important levels of anxiety. We see similar rates in caregivers of people with cancer. And, and there's some research that even suggests caregivers have higher levels of anxiety than the person with cancer. So cancer impacts the, the whole group, right? It impacts everyone. And we can see that when we look at anxiety. And we also know that anxiety between the person with cancer and their caregivers um, is interrelated. If one person is anxious, the other person is more likely to be anxious and that goes both ways. So that's why a lot of the work that we do really focuses on the person with cancer and their caregiver um, because we, we know that those folks impact each other. So that's important. So, so we talked a little bit about this already um, when someone mentioned technology as a trigger for your anxiety. So are there other things that make people anxious? So we have the technology. We actually also have the unknown as another trigger. Um, are there other triggers of anxiety that people experience? Or, and this also happens for people, does your anxiety come out of the blue? Like you're going through your day, everything seems fine. And then bam, all of a sudden you're feeling anxious. People have any thoughts about, about that, your triggers for anxiety? Oh. I have to unmute. Um, okay. You can you hear me? Uh, yep, Very simply. And then we'll take Judy. Okay. I'll be quick. 
uh, I find it <clears throat> um, anxiety producing when my people close to me seem to not believe I have cancer. Okay, sure. And and I don't, I'm in a support group at Gilda's and uh, I feel like I'm the only one where the, the uh, people close uh, don't give support. And that, sure. that causes me anxiety. Of course. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear you're in that situation. I'm glad you've connected yeah. to your support well, group. Yeah. <laughs> I've been working on it for 15 years. Okay, great. Great. Judy, how about you? I, I was just floored by what Don said. I, I can't believe that, that fam, family members that say are are denying the fact that their fa that their loved one has cancer. That's crazy. Um, but at any rate, what triggers most of the time, it, it's funny, both my husband and I are cancer survivors. Okay. But what triggers my anxiety most of the time is what he's going through, although right now I'm going through something as well. So that's, it's just there, it's um, always health related. Sometimes sure. it is professional, but most of the time it's health related. Okay, sure, sure. So you really understand how cancer and health issues can impact uh, a person and their spouse, right? Their, their partner, how those things can interact. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, thank you for sharing. So let's talk a little bit about what I've been referring to, um, this cognitive behavioral, um, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. So this is the, the model for CBT and I'll walk us, I'll walk us through it. And this is really going to guide the, the, the remainder of our conversation today about what helps manage anxiety. So you can see these, these circles here, and they have arrows in between them. And notice that the arrows are bi-directional. That means all of these, the content of all these circles impact each other, right? So the, 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 um, the way in which we think about anxiety from this perspective is the way we think our thoughts, which is the green bubble, impacts our anxiety. It can make our anxiety go up or down. And I'm going to give us a concrete example in a moment. In the same way, in the purple circle, what we do, our behaviors, can make our anxiety go up or down. When we're talking about cancer or other medical issues, the blue circle, the physical symptoms, are also a really important component because how we're feeling physically whether that's because of um, cancer, cancer treatment, or even anxiety itself, can impact not only our anxiety, but how we think and what we do. And so all of these circles impact each other. And the nice thing about this model is that it gives us a couple of ways to intervene to reduce anxiety, specifically by focusing on how we're thinking and how we're behaving. So let me take, give you a more specific example of this, because I know in the abstract, it can be a little bit hard to kind of wrap, wrap your head around. So let's start in the blue circle. Someone is having shortness of breath. Maybe this is because of their cancer treatment. This shortness of breath triggers the thought in the green bu bubble, what if my cancer is in my lungs? right? They're worried because of shortness of breath, they're worried their cancer has spread. Of course, that thought is going to increase their anxiety, right? In the red, in the red circle, now they have high anxiety. That thought, what if the cancer is in my lungs, might also cause someone to cancel all of their social activities. That's the purple circle. So now they're not seeing friends and loved ones. They're not getting support from other people. They're just staying at home because they are so worried about their cancer and having this high anxiety. But because they're staying home alone, they have more time to think about their cancer, right? So now in the, they're having more thoughts. Those thoughts are increasing their anxiety even more. We know shortness of breath is actually a symptom of anxiety. So their anxiety might be making their shortness of breath even worse. Now they're thinking more about it. Now they're doing less activities, right? So we can see this spiral where what they're thinking and what they're doing and how they're feeling just makes their anxiety go up and up and up and up and up, okay? What CBT helps us do is find ways to reverse that cycle. 
so that we can think differently to bring the anxiety down, so that we can act differently to bring the anxiety down. So that's how we're, that's how the CBT model works. I think when we talk about these strategies, it'll become even sort of more clear and hopefully helpful because it'll be ways for us to actually change how we think and what we do. But this is the global idea. So again, just to review, this is the same thing, how we think and how we behave impact how, how whether our anxiety is going up or down. Now, you might have noticed that I keep using the term managing anxiety. And the reason I'm using the word managing is because in the context of cancer, like I said at the very beginning, some anxiety is normal, right? Cancer is hard and it's scary. And so we, we're not expecting that, that you'll never feel anxious or that your anxiety will go away completely. What we're hoping is that some of these strategies will help you manage the anxiety better so that it doesn't grow and grow and grow and grow and make you more uncomfortable and interfere more with your life. But again, anxiety is normal when we're going through something as hard as cancer. So I don't want us to lose sight of, of that as well. Okay, so we're going to start with some strategies for the purple circle behaviors. What are some actions we can take to help manage anxiety? And um, these are the ones we're going to focus on. Now, you might be doing some of these already, which is great. You might also be thinking, oh, these seem kind of simple. Yes, in many ways, some of these are very simple. And that's, I think, why they're so helpful, because these are strategies that we can use in our daily lives um, throughout the day and they're to really effectively manage and reduce anxiety. So let's talk a little bit about deep breathing to start us out here. So the reason I'm showing you this picture is because when you're doing deep breathing, you want to be breathing from down here. Can you see my, my pointer sort of down by your belly button? Um, and you can see what you're, what you're looking at here is how the diaphragm sort of contracts and expands when you're taking a deep breath. What we don't want is breathing that comes from up here in the chest. <laughs> like if someone's hyperventilating, because that's gonna make your anxiety worse. What deep breathing does is activate this, the diaphragm here. And by doing that, you increase oxygen flow, which calms the body down. So if you remember, anxiety has those physical symptoms. Deep breathing is one way to calm the body, to bring down those physical symptoms. How do you do it? When you want to take a deep breath, <clears throat> the, the best way to make sure that you're breathing from your stomach area, not from your chest, is to breathe in through your nose like you're smelling flowers. Breathe out through your mouth and purse your lips like you're blowing out candles. <sighs> that pursed lip breathing creates some back pressure that um, uh, ensures that you're taking that deep breath and makes that deep breath more effective. So it's breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. This, the second important component is that those breaths are slow and controlled. So you want to, it can, it can help to count. So you can breathe in for two, like, and then breathe out for two counts. Okay, breathe in for two, breathe out for two. In, out. Okay, the number of counts is not that important. Meaning if you, can, if you wanna do three counts, that's fine. If two counts is too difficult, like you're getting tightness in your chest, or it feels like you're holding your breath, then switch to one count. Really what's important is that the breathing is slow and controlled, right? In and out, in and out. 
Um, deep breathing is very effective um, because of the reasons I mentioned. It's also really easy to do. So this is something you can stick in your back pocket. And if you're in the waiting room and feeling nervous, you can take a few deep breaths. Nobody knows the difference. Um, and it, it really can calm you down. The other thing, and we're going to talk about thoughts in a moment, is that deep breathing gives your mind something else to focus on. So if you're worrying, right, if there, are, if you're sitting in the waiting room and you're worried about the appointment, taking some deep breaths gives your brain something relaxing to focus on. And some people will even add a word as they're breathing in and out, like relax, right? They'll think relax, relax. That's a great way to get your brain more engaged in the exercise. So that's deep breathing. Let's talk a little bit about what is called progressive muscle relaxation, or sometimes people will use the abbreviation PMR. Uh, progressive muscle relaxation is just like it sounds. It's a muscle relaxation strategy that releases the tension in different parts of your body one piece at a time. So what you do is, and I'll show you a, a picture example of this on the next slide, is that you start at the top of your head and you think about your muscles in different groups. How you group them doesn't matter. But let's just say you start at the top of your head, you focus on the muscles in your forehead and you think about relaxing those muscles, right? Releasing the tension. Right. So if your eyebrows are way up, right, you can relax your eyebrows, let those muscles relax. Then you can move to the muscles in your in your cheeks and jaw and focus on just relaxing those muscles, releasing that tension. Right. So if you're clenching your teeth, right? Like if your if your jaw is real tight, you can relax those muscles. Then you can move to your neck and your shoulders and just focus on relaxing those muscles, right? Dropping your shoulders. And so what you keep doing this, one group of muscles at a time, however you want to group them, all the way down to your toes, right? So you're progressively, right? The progressive, you're progressively relaxing all of your muscles from your head to your feet. When you get to the, your feet, you scan back up through your body, to find areas where that tension might've snuck back in. So while you were relaxing your, your, your thighs, maybe your shoulders got tight again. That's okay. When you scan back up, you just relax those muscles. Like I said, there's no magic way of breaking your muscles down. This is a very simple illustration of one way to do it. Um, but really, the, the goal is to work from head to toe, relaxing all of your muscles. I have had people say that they don't, they don't feel like they have muscle tension, which some people don't. And if that's you, that's fine. But then when they try progressive muscle relaxation, they come back and they say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize how tense my neck was until I focused on relaxing those muscles. Or I didn't realize that like I was clenching my stomach muscles all of the time until I worked on relaxing them. So it might be something that you want to give a try just in case you're holding some tension somewhere um, that you're not aware of to relax. And this, the reason this is helpful is one, muscle tension is a very common symptom of anxiety, particularly lots of people will hold tension in their neck and in their shoulders, which can cause headaches um, and uh, back discomfort. Um, the other, um, so it's a symptom of anxiety, but then also there's a feedback loop in your brain, right? If the muscles are tense, your brain thinks, oh, there must be something wrong. We should be anxious. And so by releasing that tension, you sort of tell your brain, it's okay. We're, everything's okay, right? We don't need to feel anxious. So this is progressive muscle, muscle relaxation. And then the third strategy is guided imagery. So this can be a nice technique if you're having trouble falling asleep or if you wake up in the middle of the night and, you're, um, and your thoughts are running. Guided imagery um, is, again, what the name suggests, these names are very descriptive, is that you're picturing a relaxing image in your mind. Maybe it's your favorite vacation spot, 
your favorite place in your home. Maybe it's a starry sky. It doesn't matter as long as it's a relaxing image for you. And you want to make that image as real as possible. And so there are some questions listed here you can ask yourself, right? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? Because you really want to get your brain engaged in this relaxing image. And the idea is that it gives your brain something to focus on rather than whatever thoughts or worries you have. And the, the thing that you're focused on is this relaxing image. Um, and so it helps calm your body and calm and calm your brain. Um, in addition to when you are, um, if you're having trouble falling asleep, uh, some people will find this strategy really helpful if they're um, going through some kind of procedure, right? And they're, and they're nervous about it. Um, this gives their brain something to focus on rather than whatever procedure is happening. If it's a blood draw, that sort of thing. So these are, those were some strategies for the purple circle, um, for the behaviors. I just want to pause here and check in to see if there are any questions about any of those. Where does uh, self-hypnosis fit into this model? I've uh, had, I've attended a couple sessions on that, uh, again, on Gilda's. Yeah, sure. I think, um, so Probably it could fall in the behavioral circle, um, but there's also a, a component that focuses on your thoughts. So it kind of hits both, I would think, um, which is okay, right? These We're separating these circles for illustration, but there certainly are some strategies that cross both. But um, I, would, I would think maybe it, it would fit in with the behaviors. Is that, what is your experience? That would be my guess also, but uh, I, I found it, Personally, not easy to do. Uh, friends of mine have said, you know, they really swear by it. But I, so I don't know myself. But uh, anyway, I, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. Self hypnosis is a little harder, um, and so some of the 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 techniques we talked about here are a little easier to use. Maybe a little more. Like I said, you can put them in your back pocket and kind of use them wherever you are. Um, but certainly, self hypnosis can be helpful for some people. Okay, let's switch and talk about the green circle thoughts. Um, and I'd like if if people are comfortable sharing, um, I'd like to hear about what goes through your mind when you're feeling anxious or what kinds of thoughts do you have that make you anxious? What kind of worries? I, I, I'm sorry, I feel I'm talking too much, but... Um... I'm on a three month schedule for check checking again. It's my, okay. my flavor is prostate cancer. So I'm checked every three months. And um, frankly, I've got down to the point now where I only get anxious the night before. And I, de I deliberately don't look at the lab results. I let my oncologist tell me what they mean. Why? Okay. Because the first time I did that, I was wrong. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. But but the, the one thing uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I, I, I appreciate your comments. What I've tried to do, I'm, I've been on wait and see for six years which means I don't have any treatments, which is good. I think it's good. But uh, basically, uh, I know what the next treatment is. And I've done all I can to find out what will that mean. And that doesn't make me feel good. But on the other hand, at least I know it's what to, what's going to be the worst case. Okay. So anyway, that, that's, that's what goes through my mind a day, the night before. Okay. Okay. So sort of with worrying about the outcome of the test and then thinking about what the worst case might be are some of the thoughts that go through your mind, but you found a way to, to keep them contained at least to the night before, um, which is great. Okay, thank you. With, yeah, with me, yeah, mm -hmm. with me um, my husband and I actually had to cancel the trip, not because of the cancer, but it might have been whatever I'm going through now might be related to something that I had to do because of the cancer. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it's the thought of canceling the trip again. I mm -hmm. keep on telling myself that we, we we were supposed to go April 18th. Now, God willing, we're going to go June 19th. Okay. And um, I keep on telling myself that this is has to, 
What has to be resolved has to do with either an ear issue or a dental issue or a combination of both, but whatever. Um, I keep on saying to myself that I have more than a month to resolve it. So okay. that's the way that I try to control it. It doesn't always help. Yeah. Because in the meantime that I do have sometimes ear pain, thank God today is a good day. But when it isn't, there's, there's ear pain involved. So there's pain that triggers the thought that we might have to cancel the trip again. Sure. But I keep on telling myself I have so much time and I'm working on resolving it. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Judy, a couple things I heard you say there. One, you know, the physical symptoms like ear pain trigger the thoughts about canceling the trip. Right. And so we see that very clearly here and you described that so well in your experience. Um, the other thing I heard though, I heard you use the word control and I just want to highlight that because that's going to come up in a moment. And I'm so glad you mentioned it because there are things that we can control and you mentioned those, right? You have a month to take care of this. You're doing what you need to do. And then with cancer and, and lots of things in life, but in, in this case, we're thinking about cancer. There are lots of things that we can't control and yet they still make us very anxious, right? So what do we do with that? So we're going to get to that in a moment. And I'm so, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Anybody else want to share um, any thoughts that make them anxious or what they think about when they're um, feeling anxious? I just don't want to miss anybody. Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, about thoughts. So thoughts are often really automatic, meaning they, they, they just jump into our head, right? They're there. Um, and that can make them really hard to manage. But the thing is, the way in which we think really impacts how we feel, how worried we feel, how anxious we feel. And so um, where we sort of get caught, right? Because they're automatic, they're happening kind of without our influence, right? They're just coming at us. And yet, they, make, they can make us feel very anxious. We're going to talk about two broad types of thoughts. One are unrealistic worries. So these are thoughts that we have that have a piece of untruth. There's something in the thought that doesn't quite fit with the situation. We all have these kinds of thoughts. They're really common, um, but they can increase our anxiety. So we're going to talk about how do we find the ways in which our thoughts might have mistakes or errors in them. And then we're going to talk about realistic worries, which get, gets back to what Judy was just saying about control, that there are some thoughts that they're not errors, they're right. And, and yet they're about something we can't control. We can't do anything about it, but yet they make us very anxious. So how do we handle those thoughts? So we're going to talk about those two broad buckets, so to speak, of these different kinds of thoughts. So let's, let's start with unrealistic thoughts, or these are sometimes called thought errors, meaning they just have a piece of untruth in them, something that's not quite right. And I want to highlight again, these thoughts are common. Every human being has them. That's why we have things like lists of them, which I've put some here. So I don't want you to think that if you have some of these thoughts, there's something wrong with you or something wrong with your thinking. These are very common. We're just going to learn how to catch them. So the first one is all or nothing thinking or black and white thinking. Um, this is where we, we think it's either only the two extremes are possible. We overlook the gray, right? So for example, if someone thinks, if this scan is bad, I'm definitely going to fall apart. Right? The all or nothing thinking is I'm definitely going to fall apart. The extreme. Okay. The second thought error is overgeneralization. This is when our thoughts take something small and focused and apply it broadly in our lives. So instead of keeping the problem like right here, we we meet we we take its meaning and we expand it. Right. So for example, overgeneralization, someone might think, oh, I have I have a little pain in my side. My cancer must be back. 
right? They're taking the pain in their side, right? Which is one, one problem, one, one thing. And they're saying that mean they're generalizing. They're saying it's something much bigger. And of course, if you think that you're going to feel more anxious, right? You're going to feel more worried. Jumping to conclusions or another way of thinking about this is worst case scenario is when we think about the worst possible outcome and we just focus on that. And we don't look at all the other possible outcomes that might happen. So a very basic one is, I know this scan is going to be bad, right? Worst case scenario. And then the more we think about the worst case scenario, the more likely it seems, right? So now in our minds, we're thinking the scan is definitely going to be bad that worst case scenario feels really likely. And so of course we feel more anxious. Can I just add something, if you don't mind? Yeah. I mean, because I, I do look personally for a worst case, but then I go a step further and I say, then what will I do then? Okay, sure. In other words, I try to negate or nullify the worst of the worst. Yep, that's definitely a great strategy for handling thoughts about the worst case scenario is thinking, how would I handle it? Because then you have a plan. I think the other way of, of handling a worst case scenario is thinking about all the other possible scenarios, right? So that I, I don't, we don't know what's going to happen. The worst case could happen, but what else might be possibilities, right? Maybe the scan is good. Right. And, and just making sure we're seeing the range of possible outcomes instead of just focusing on the worst. So, yes, thanks, Don. That's a great strategy. Should statements are really common. I should have eaten healthier. I should have slept more. I should have gone to the doctor earlier. I should I shouldn't have done X, Y, Z. And, and these um, are often very self-critical thoughts that aren't very helpful. There, there's nothing we can do about it. We're just beating ourselves up, which makes us more anxious. And then mind reading is when we assume we know what someone else is thinking, right? And oftentimes when we do that, well, I'll just put it this way. We're not very good mind readers. We're not very good mind. We get it wrong. And usually we get it wrong in a way that feels, um, that is negative and makes us feel more anxious when in fact, the person wasn't thinking that at all, right? People will often mind read their oncologists because they're, you know, you're trying to get as much information as possible. And so I, had one person say, like, oh, my oncologist wasn't really making eye contact. So I figured that meant like she was going to give me bad news, right? Which it didn't mean, right? I don't, I, I, the oncologist maybe just was having a bad day um, and, or was distracted a little bit in that moment. But the, the person was really doing a lot of mind reading about what that meant. And that just made her more anxious. Okay. So if we have these worries, what do we do about it? Um, we can ask ourselves some questions about our thoughts to see if there is an error. So the first one is, are we using words or phrases that are extreme or exaggerated? So if you're thinking something and it has words like always, forever, never, definitely, extreme words, that's a cue to you to stop and take a look at that thought. Think like, is it true that this always happens or this never happens? Question yourself because what might be happening is that you're focused on the extremes, black and white. Maybe you're thinking about the worst case scenario. And so you can say to yourself, well, it's not, it's not really always. It's really just sometimes. It brings the anxiety down. Does the thought include the word should if it or shouldn't? Goes both ways. If it does, you might have a should statement there. And you want to you want to take a look at that and say, well, is that true? Right. I'm going to give you some examples here in a moment. It's always helpful to think about: is there an alternative explanation or an alternative outcome here? Right? Is there a different is there a different way of seeing this? I'm thinking about the worst case scenario. What's the best case scenario? Can we factor that in? Are you focused on negative emotion and missing the positive? So oftentimes we focus on the negative, which might be true, but then we don't include the positive in our thinking. And of course that makes us more anxious because we're just seeing negative, negative, negative. And again, the negative might be true. I'm not saying it's not, but let's also build in the positive, the positive side of things as well. 
And then finally, a really easy way to do this, if some of these other questions seem more difficult, is just ask yourself, is this thought helpful? Is it helpful for me to think this way? And if the answer is no, then that's a cue to maybe think, consider a different way of thinking about the thinking about the situation. So let's look at some examples. I know this can feel a little abstract. So let's look at some examples of how you might have a thought error and then replace that thought error with a better thought, a thought that makes you less anxious. So let's look at some examples. So the thought here is, if the scan is bad, I will definitely need to quit working. So you can see, see some extreme language. I will definitely need to quit working. What might be a different way of thinking? If this scan is bad, I will need to talk to my doctor about working and making a plan with my boss. We're not saying that this, we're not saying necessarily the scan will be good, we don't know, but it's kind of like Don was saying, what, what is my plan if the scan is bad, right? Maybe I don't definitely need to quit working. Here's a different way of thinking about it. Another thought error, the oncologist is taking a long time. The results must be bad. Worst case scenario, right? What are some different ways of thinking? The oncologist is taking a long time. She must be busy, right? Lots of reasons the oncologist is taking a long time, right? Oh, he is always running late, right? Again, Lots of reasons the oncologist is bad. The first thought assumes the worst case, but let's let's think about some other alternatives. And then finally, I gave you this one earlier. I have a pain in my side. My cancer must be back. This is that generalization. I did a lot of gardening yesterday. I must have strained a muscle. Different explanation for the situation. Or... If the pain doesn't get better in two days, I'll send my oncologist a message. So instead of having the thought that your cancer is back and letting that swirl and swirl and swirl in your head, these are just some different ways of thinking about it. Okay. So these are the, these are the unrealistic worries or the thought errors. I see we're coming down to the top of our, our time here. So I'm gonna just skip this and talk about so we talked about unrealistic worries. Let's talk about realistic worries. What are realistic worries? These are worries that are true. Cancer creates a lot of these. In addition, these are worries that we can't resolve with action. So these might be worries like, what if my cancer comes back? What does my future look like? Right, these aren't errors. Right? These are things that people dealing with cancer worry about. So they're true, but, but we can't do anything right now about that. Okay? There's nothing we can do. But these are really anxiety-producing thoughts. And sometimes what we try to do when we have these thoughts, we try to control them, right? Well, we, we try to not, we might tell ourselves, don't think about that. Or else someone will say, like, I just try to push that into the back of my head. And I say, like, how does that work? People say like, well, it works for a while, but pretty soon like that thought sneaks back up, right? And they push it back again, and then, woo, it sneaks back up, right? And so what happens is, this is a figure, this is a little picture to show us what this might look like. What happens is when we try to control that kind of thought, it's like being in, in a tug of war. In a tug of so the monster is the thought that we're trying to control, right? We try to push it back and it sneaks back up. We try to push it back and it sneaks back up. And when we're doing that, we're like this gentleman here, right? He has both hands on this rope. He's pulling with all of his might. He's sweating, right? He's grinding his teeth. He's totally engaged in this fight with this monster. And this doesn't really work, right? This doesn't really, this doesn't really work. It's sort of like when we say, don't think about cake right? Or don't think about a pink elephant. We can't do it because as soon as I say, don't think about a pink elephant, you're thinking about a pink elephant. And what happens is when we, when, as we pull on that rope, as we try not to think about cake, that thought just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger because we're focused more on it. And because we're focused more on it, we're not living life, right? We're not living life. This gentleman is not 
all he's doing is fighting with the monster. He's not engaged in anything enjoyable or, or good, right? And so we don't want, this is, not a, this is not a good way to live. So what do we do about that? Well, the alternative to trying to control these thoughts, the alternative to the tug of war is something called acceptance. Now, acceptance does not mean you like it. I want to make that clear, right? I'm not saying like, oh, just be okay with it. No, it's not being okay with it. It is learning how to drop the rope. We don't like the monster and he's still there. But acceptance is learning how to live even though the monster is there. Do we wish he went away? Yeah, absolutely. But we can't control that. What we can control is how are we pulling on that rope? Can we let that go? Okay, how do we do that, right? That, that's how to, where the rubber hits the road, right? So first of all, we just wanna be aware that this is the experience we're having, right? That we have worries like, what does the future look like? How am I gonna react to this treatment? Being aware of that, right? Just recognizing it and not judging that, right? That's a normal thought. That's an okay thought to have. There's nothing wrong with you for worrying about it. Then we sort of make room for it, right? We're not gonna try to control it. We're not gonna try to fight it. We're just gonna say, there it is, right? There's my worry about this treatment. And then instead of focusing on that worry, right? And trying to control it, we're gonna turn our attention back to life to the present moment, to the things that we enjoy doing. And we're gonna focus there. So whether that's loved ones, spending time with loved ones, um, doing activities that you enjoy, um, whatever that might be. What it, the idea is let's continue to live a meaningful life even though that monster is there. So it's like this right? Here's the monster, right? He's still there, but now the gentleman is living, right? He's engaging. He's engaging with his friends, his loved ones, right? doing something meaningful. I had one woman a long time ago, I was working at a different place. We were talking about this and she shared that she had worries about cancer recurrence, cancer coming back. And she said that she pictured those thoughts as a rock in her purse. So when she put her purse on to go out for the day, the rock was there. She could feel it, it was heavier, she didn't like it. But she said, instead of that rock weighing me to the ground and keeping me from living my life, I'm just gonna heft it up and move forward. I'm just going to do what I want to do during the day and take that rock with me. And again, she didn't like the rock. It made it harder for her, but it didn't keep her from doing the things she wanted to do. That's the idea of acceptance, right? Is that there are some things we can't control. And so the question becomes not how do we get rid of it, but how do we live with it? And again, I recognize it's not ideal. I wish none of us had to do this. Um, but when we can't control something, the alternative is that it keeps us from living our lives. And that's what we're trying not to have happen here. What, what is radical acceptance? Uh, there's lots of words around acceptance. Um, and, and really the whole, there's a whole treatment around it. That's really based in a lot of semantics. Um, it's, it's kind of the same thing, really. I wouldn't get too like caught up in the different lingo. What I've given you is a broad overview. Radical acceptance kind of gets more specific and um, into a lot of detail about it. Um, but it's, it's sort of the same broad idea. So um, I know we're, I, we're coming down to the end of our, our time. Um, uh, let me just give you, um, I just want to give you a little bit of information. So part of my job here at MSK, um, like Erin mentioned at the beginning, is to help find ways to help people with cancer and their caregivers manage anxiety. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about a project we're doing now called the Melody Study. And um, there's contact information about it 
here if you're interested. So this is a project where we're, we're looking at two kinds of um, programs for managing anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what we just talked about, and music therapy. And we're um, seeing how these two programs help people with cancer manage their anxiety. So I just kind of wanted to let you know about this. If you're interested in more information, you can contact um, the, the study contact here and they can give you lots more details about what it entails and who, who is appropriate. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that this is a resource that's, that is also available. So that's my plug for the for, for the Melody project. F feel free to give us a call if you're interested. Um, so I'm happy to, to stick around for another moment and answer people's questions. I, I hope that there was something here that might be helpful to you, something that you might be able to incorporate to try to manage anxiety. Um, it's been a real pleasure um, talking with you, and I, I appreciate everyone.